My uh, pleasure to introduce Steve Grudis. He is the Senior Engineering Manager at I Air Labs, which is a silicon photonic startup. Um, he has worked for many semiconductor companies, including Texas Instruments, Micron, and Intel, and working for assembly and packaging companies, including Samtech, Microelectronics, and Plexus Worldwide. In addition, uh, simulation software at ANSYS. So very wide range of things, and I'm looking forward to a very exciting presentation on silicon photonics. So Steve, take it away. Thanks, Ira. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, I appreciate your attendance. And I also appreciate uh, Ira and the uh, MAPTAC team for pulling this together, both with Ravi and Jasper Gandhi as well. Um, my outline is fairly short. I'd like to do a broad view of silicon photonics, particularly our optical IO chip flip called Terrify. Uh, work into Design for X. My background is when I originally started in the industry was reliability, package reliability, and the concept of designing in reliability happened uh, at that point in time. So it has evolved into many things, and that's why it's great that we talk about design for X. We'll also talk about design enablement of what's required for modeling and design tools in general. And then finally, the proof's in the pudding. So um, I'll give you one example of a test vehicle that we have called Pico Killington. It's a dual die package, and then summarize. Um, obviously, we have to have a marketing slide so that we have beautiful graphics, but not too far away from reality is this particular multi-chip um, system on a chip with optical I.O. in place. The issue here is to um, really increase the bandwidth density, at the same time reduce the power, reduce the latency, and also fit it within a normal form factor used in the industry. There are um, new components here. Uh, the fiber optics are one example of that. Um, the optical IO chips and chiplets themselves. And so this is what I'll be talking to uh, during my talk. Uh, the Terrify package, or the chip itself, um, you see the features there, I won't read through them, but they're obviously very tempting for advanced technology, for the use of high-speed um, components in uh, high-power computing, computing uh, optical or um, artificial intelligence and other applications, telecommunications where speed is of the utmost importance. Latency also should be reduced. The chiplet itself has eight optical ports as uh, seen there in the transmit and receive. Uh, they are also uh, acting as um, uh, the, uh, I'll say the um, transceiver part of the system. Also, we have on the opposite side of the chip, a. Uh, fiber array, these are the grooved um, elements of a um, chip lit. I'll show you more graphics there. And then additional parts there, but we have basically a multi-protocol serial interface uh, for in-package interconnects. Uh, one of the beauties is that the possibility of um, achieving 3.7 terabytes per second per chiplet in full duplex mode is a, is a growing possibility. Last year, we demonstrated an error-free one terabit per second version of Terrify. Um, to be honest, we actually went well above that on some samples as well. So we have the upward uh, bandwidth um, figured out pretty well, and we'll be able to then transfer that into a roadmap, which then starts to extend that uh, quite high. Design enablement. <clears throat> um, my background, as I read, pointed out, there is some level of modeling and simulation. Um, obviously, the famous computer scientist Richard Hamming said, um, simulations 
uh, are more than just numbers. Computer simulations are more than numbers. They provide insight. And that's how I've used the tools uh, in the past. Some of the questions being asked originally are the um, modeling and design tools interoperable uh, to do the relevant analysis? Yeah, um, I guess the basic and simple answer, it depends because it's kind of situation dependent. Uh, do simulation teams and modeling tools language boundary conditions? In many ways, we're trying to make the simulation problem or um, modeling problem as simple as possible, but not too simple. So we're using uh, such modeling concepts as reduced order models, uh, rules of mixture to help us to bring these into more um, current uh, computing uh, platforms capable. Um, the next part is, um, more importantly, is when we do the modeling, we do need to validate the models. And as Thomas pointed out, um, we don't, uh, no one trusts a model except the person that built it. And so the convincing part is through characterization, uh, whether that be metrology, inspection, uh, materials, strengths, and such. So we do a, a, a good amount of that as well. And then finally, uh, how to avoid custom scripts or hacks into the design flow. And that's basically to use the intrinsic macro language, uh, whether that be in a simulation tool like ANSYS um, with its macro language or a design tool as well, using the approved API tools within the software. Um, Multi-chip uh, thermal simulations, very, very important. Uh, moving forward, power density increases quite uh, precipitously, and as a result, we want to have this first time right success. Obviously, uh, heterogeneous integration is a, um, a complicating factor, uh, bringing all these functions together, but um, certainly thermal dissipation, uh, also uh, localized hotspots and being able to deal with them is an important part. On top of all this are the thermal solutions, bringing it back to just the hardware part of it, doing careful design of a heat sink to take use of the fan within a box, using an integrated heat spreader in order to pull out heat at the right place at the right time. And a little bit more um, um, high end of our vapor chambers and be able to uh, form a pedestal which uh, brings the heat into a vapor chamber and through uh, evaporation condensation principles, be able to cool, effectively cool something with a high power density. And that's where uh, quite a bit of co-design is a very important part of this as well. Electromechanical, um, these are areas in which the first advent of it was with the uh, through silicon via, uh, the importance of knowing how stress changes the uh, device physics of a chip. Um, the necessary part of that is to uh, know full well the uh, material science which is involved. So we've developed languages of uh, stress uh, because of chip to package interactions. So CI, CPI, and also to do keep out zones. These keep out zones can be for stress, can be for um, underfill bleeding, um, also just mechanical fitment within the package. So in many cases, um, understanding and being able to use both an ECAD tool and an EBCAD tool is pretty important to prove out the success of the handshaking. And then finally, what you end up with is a more robust design which helps with productivity and faster time to market. Here's a typical uh, silicon photonics uh, design and verification flow. As you can see, it's multi-staged. We have levels of abstraction, uh, depending on where we're at in the design flow. We have both a front-end design and a back-end design, uh, not uh, specifically aligned with wafer and packaging. And then finally, we have fabrication and test. Uh, this being a, a silicon photonics chiplet, 
uh, the importance is to both do both an optical test and an electrical test. By the way, this is just one chip. This is a monolithic electro-optical chip. Um, we are also open to dividing that out and making a, a uh, electrical integrated circuit and a photonics integrated circuit. Uh, but we enjoy the, um, the um, luxury of having a uh, fully integrated monolithic chip. Um, as we get into the flows, now we're starting to solve more of a uh, physics-related problem versus an electronics-related problem. So we're dealing with P-cells, which really are waveguides. And um, we then also have compact models to back those up. And then, uh, obviously, design rules to also work with that. A typical PIC chip will go through this upper half. And then through the PDK definition, through the foundry, the uh, circuit definition, pr uh, parametrization, um, circuit simulation, and also the uh, place and route and verification are as a result of working with the PDK. So you have these two um, levels of design. The upper half is a device designer and the lower half is a circuit designer. Um, we enjoy the luxury of emulating that. Uh, so what you end up with in this case uh, being demonstrated is a standard photonics integrated circuit. Uh, you're manually picking a lot of this. Um, we have a customized flow where we auto generate these large photonic, I'll say subsets or sub circuits, a um, little bit uh, in a fashion where we're able to pull these directly into an SOC design. Um, we're learning from the past, much like the famous Spanish philosopher George Santillana said, uh, those that aren't learning from the past are doomed to repeat it, particularly in bad situations. We don't want to lose any efficiency in the design process, particularly at the chip le level. Pure design uh, aspects, yeah, obviously, early delivery of an accurate design kit is critical for design. That was stated 10 years ago. Um, we find that if we had to choose, an early PDK is preferred. Yeah, it may have a few missing elements, but we can achieve an awful lot of work for design enablement, um, uh, waiting for a fully accurate PDK. So you always get some of your design if you start with it early, but in the accurate PDK. However, there is, if there's no PDK, it doesn't matter how accurate it will be. The design can't start, the boundary can't run designs and improve the yields and the models can't get any more accurate. So we talk about things very similar to logic design, um, uh, uh, ASIC design, and that we talk about standard cells. These can be electrical, these can be photonic, and a very healthy IP ecosystem are key to build this IP early, to make it as broad as possible is uh, one of the key initiatives at Bayer Labs. Here's also an example of a photonics design flow. Um, it's really trying to base itself on uh, existing EDA flows, electronic design um, automation. Um, again, talking about this, the front end flow is really a schematic editor, the back end flow is a layout editor. And we're focused here on keeping the schematic and the layout aligned. So that's probably the more critical part of the design flow. And we always, uh, at the end, before tape out, do a functional verification as well. Um, detail. Uh, geometry is extracted into building blocks with compact numerical models. Compact models, um, in many cases, are almost the lifeblood of the SOCs of the future. And we also implement a full electromagnetic wave with really just uh, signals so that we can make these compact models very efficient. Um, after fabrication, we do design and simulation. We compare that to actual measurements and test results. 
that helps to strengthen the design flow uh, quite nicely. And there's a reference there um, on early work um, in 2018 for uh, laser photonics. Also, um, electro-optical, um, we're working on symbols and components here to define our growing system. And the importance is that will be both electrical and optical. We cannot separate the two and have a fully coupled model. So we have to keep them together and keep the model simple, but not too simple. Uh, for the audience, I thought it would be beneficial to at least uh, reference the photonics design tools and electrical design tools here just as a reference. In our case, we tend to use a few of these uh, photonics design tools. One of those be uh, Lumerica from uh, ANSYS. It is a tool that helps us to design our guided uh, portion of the optical signal in particular. So we can actually break it into segments uh, from, the fiber, from the laser source to the fiber into the uh, spot size converter and then into the waveguide itself on chip. So the beauty is that we have that uh, back end part of it pretty well defined and uh, correlated. Design for apps. Um, I was asked, uh, Steve, why talk about product uh, management at this point? Well, we usually find that we, we start the process of design for X during our requirements documents, interfacing with both the market, with the customer, with our definition of what the product should look like, and then finally on the right hand side, an engineering requirements document. So we're fully defining the product specification, any technical requirements, and the beauty there is that we can now make this sort of a framework to go into design phases, to uh, assemble, to test, and then eventually product release. So that's how it comes um, really in a, um, uh, an automated and a structural format. <clears throat> The things we test for, I list the failures, the types of uh, parameters that we're after, um, the, the transmit and receive, we're using uh, micro ring resonators, 120 of them on chip, uh, on the chiplet. We look at uh, insertion loss, return loss, responsivity, dark current, uh, modulation in particular for both efficiency and bandwidth. And then we use a photo detector as well within the chiplet to look at the photo detector's bandwidth. Since optics are, and photonics in general are very temperature sensitive, we actually have a, um, a heater system to allow us to make use of the transmit and receive and also to tune the efficiency of that transmit and receive. Uh, we also inspect for the V-group. Um, obviously, it's an orientation-dependent etch in silicon. So we look at the etch width and depth because that will be the mechanical fitment, per se, of the fiber onto the chip. So this is a uh, uh, basically an edge-based um, uh, optical coupling. And then fiber polarization because we're concerned about misalignment as well. As I said, uh, my background's in reliability, uh, sort of that focus of ensuring that the product system, any portion of that from, from device to component to uh, board performs at a specified function within a given environment over an expected lifetime. So DRF or DFR, um, should be done as early as possible, mainly for the four reasons there. Um, a lot of times we like to do this even before physical prototyping, where we're building parts and tools and developing our bomb uh, bill of materials. So product differentiate, differentiation benefits very much by a holistic design for reliability. Um, a reliability assurance uh, starts us out very well when we have this principle of design for reliability throughout the design process, both the chip and the package. 
you get to control your costs because over 70% of a project's budget is on the design phase. And we also, as a result, get to preserve our profits and um, get to market earlier, uh, avoid the erosion of sales and marketing share as well. Uh, photonics test vehicle. Here we're after um, really an understanding of how can we wrestle with the past? And uh, part of that is um, uh, we can leverage what we've done um, in our pure EVA design tools. And then um, also with a set of loosely defined rules for our packages. Um, our OSATs are very, very astute. We've chosen them as tier one suppliers. It's so important for us to not lose any cadence from going with an excellent foundry uh, through um, uh, the development of the package. So we deal with ADAs, also reference flows as much as possible, uh, make them automated, and then really work towards getting a characterization technique or set of characterization techniques uh, through metrology and any others that uh, both IR Labs and our partners are really bought into, um, understand, uh, have incorporated design for manufacturability and design for reliability so that it can be as high as possible. Uh, and the metrics are um, uh, very well thought out for DFM and um, DFR. So uh, another question was, how does design integration drive test vehicles? Well, in many ways, since we're all dealing with multi-layers of low K and ultra low K and extreme low K um, dielectrics on the surface, um, the, the chip uh, to package interactions become very, very, uh, uh, it's, it's a very high metric for us to always uh, plan ahead and think about the reliability of the chip once it's uh, been assembled and packaged. And it's an honest expression of uh, good DFM. Uh, we do a lot of simulation looking towards both the thermal, thermal mechanical, mechanical itself, uh, really to make them more robust and to provide the insight that we're after for product manufacturability, um, performance, reliability. One of the things that we uh, and were asked uh, also with this question was cost effectiveness and prototyping. Uh, IR defined a, uh, uh, both a, chip, a chiplet and a um, uh, interposer and made it a test vehicle uh, approximately two years ago. And it's basically a subset of the terrified chiplet, production chiplet. Uh, but really aim towards having a successful assembly and packaging DFM set of principles. Um, as you may know, uh, chip to packaging interaction really has drawn a lot of attention, uh, particularly when you're dealing with low K, you're dealing with either wire bonding, copper pillars, solder joint or solder joint, uh, solder balls, um, C4 technology. It, it exercises the strength of materials. So one of the things of CPI is really working towards a manufacturability and reliability um, framework. We've, then we'd like to monitor anything that's happening as far as cracking uh, through the assembly operation, delamination, crack propagation, temperature rises. Some of the test structures that we've developed are uh, focused in on are First of all, the macro uh, heater, um, an RTD. Um, we look at uh, corner stitches for solder joint reliability, also crack detection. I'll show you where they are on this particular test jump. And obviously strain gauges and daisy chain structures are of growing importance with the high number of IO that we're dealing with. And then the whole premise behind the test vehicle is to really eliminate known failure mechanisms and also look for those new ones as well. 
Here's a solid model. It's very simplified, but it shows you what we're dealing with with this PICO uh, test vehicle chiplet. Um, obviously, on the on the uh, right, we're dealing with some uh, micro uh, top through pillars. This forms the basis for the interconnect for the ABI, which is advanced interface bus. Um, also, it's this. In the middle is the uh, more of a what we call the core copper pillar um, um, interconnects, and then finally uh, the V groups and the spot size converter um, form the optical basis for this uh, chiplet as well. Um, here's a uh, top view of the uh, Pico uh, chiplet, uh, specifically for chip package interactions. Um, obviously, we need a, uh, a few heaters on the chip. Uh, there's five in this case. Uh, the resistance temperature detectors, uh, we've got 12 of them located. They're in the open uh, circles. And then finally, um, we have strain gauges populated. We only have one pair on this particular chiplet. Um, we also have a crack detection, um, which is basically uh, similar to a great wall of tungsten to help us look for saw damage and other mishandlings of the chip itself. And then we have the corner stitches and a daisy chain uh, set as well. So these, as pointed out in the note, uh, these structures are two to four terminal type resistive devices. Uh, we can depopulate and uh, sort of, um, um, the whole idea is that if we were to depopulate, we would break the, uh, Test structure. So we have to do a careful planning as to how we configure the chip as well, the chiplet. Um, the test vehicle goals were to really help us understand within a silicon, uh, two and a half D silicon interposer based multi chip uh, package using copper pillars, flip chip, uh, IOSMF, which is a uh, uh, global foundries uh, photonics based. Um, uh, system. You can see it down there below in the reference section, but we're bringing the uh, optical fibers. Uh, it shows an SMF, but we're using PMF, which is polarization maintaining fiber. SMF is a single mode fiber, and we're now making it a workhorse for the assembly and, and packaging part of all this. We have uh, basically industry acceptable. Um, uh, assembly yields and uh, reliability metrics. Uh, we've demonstrated uh, some reliable uh, supply chains. It's important for us to continue that. Obviously, there are some pressures in this uh, pandemic world to help um, work towards um, a more robust supply chain management system. And that is um, one of our major goals as well. Well, I talked about the chiplets. Um, um, we also need to have an optical uh, power supply and that being what we call supernova. Uh, these are remote lasers. The beauty is that they're field replaceable. Uh, we show them in a close proximity to the uh, multi-chip package and to the terrified chiplets but they can actually be located anywhere within a server box rack. Um, so they have a little bit more freedom for placement, but they also perform a vital part of this optical IO uh, as a power source. So um, we've given this a lot of thought and the remoteness just is enhancing its value proposition. So here's sort of a flatland view of um, uh, what we'll call uh, co-packaged optics. Um, we have uh, either a CPU, GPU, FPGA, ASIC, uh, structured ASIC within one um, interposer system with an uh, organic package. Uh, what you see there is it could be the packages could be separated and it's sort of a transmit receive or a multiple transmit. There's no reason not to bring in memory here as well with the uh, UCIE uh, standard. We talk about disaggregated, pooled, uh, 
So we're turning uh, memory into more of an appliance within the compute system. And what you also see there is a continuous wave, um, multi-wavelength uh, product of supernova. Uh, we've been able to basically qualify supernova up to about 80 C. That's last year, error free. Um, but also, um, lasers are very difficult to bring down in a cost effective manner, also to bring down in a reliability manner. So, we um, um, are working to extend the success of this product, its benefits for the industry. And uh, as you can see, it can be at a socket level, which um, I guess the quote was uh, PCI is analogous or PCI is to motherboards as uh, UCIE is to socket. So uh, dealing with the infrastructure of electrical systems, but with an optical interface really brings on a lot of power and success. So with that, I'd like to wrap up a little bit. Um, you saw that uh, chip to package interaction, it isn't stopping as we integrate optics into a package. Um, it's good DFM, um, really provides an understanding that our, um, our act active face of the chip is still sensitive uh, given the uh, multiple layers of uh, low K, ultra low K, extreme low K, and also the designs are much tighter as well. Um, to select a material, um, this is true for uh, electrical, it's true for electric optics, is once you choose a material, you've pretty much decided the reliability, the product reliability that you will uh, accommodate. So careful selection of materials is probably one of the most important factors within designing the uh, optical I.O. package. Uh, finally, design enablement, uh, both the chiplet and package code design have become more prevalent, and I think they make success along this road to chiplets. And then finally, the chiplet test vehicle. Um, we, I mentioned a few essential uh, test structures. Uh, they've really proven to detect some of the things at advanced nodes, um, particularly in the area of stress sensitivity and thin films in nature. <clears throat> I'd like to first of all thank my colleagues, um, our suppliers, the customers that we've dealt with, um, particularly in the area of Pico Killington. Um, it's still an ongoing program and a lot of focus is still on it. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge um, the um, MapTech team. Um, it does take a lot of work to organize this well in advance and then be able to accept changes along the way. So um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ira and team as well. So uh, I think that opens us up for uh, questions and answers. I'd like to thank you for your attention because without your attention, this would still uh, be a PowerPoint with uh, waiting for an audience. Thank you, Ira. Thank you, Steve. Really, really fascinating and my, I, I mean, I'll ask the audience questions, but I'm going to come back. There are so many cross-domain questions I have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I hope I can do them justice. Okay. So the, the, the first question, and um, they're using some acronyms, is what is your view on the performance scalability of integrated EIC and PIC? So is that photonic integrated circuits? and Yes. Electronic and electrical. Right. Yeah, that's basically the heterogeneous part of this, too. Um, I believe uh, most of this says that both have um, a place in the ecosystem. Um, early on in 2010, as a university project, the founders of IR Labs decided to make it a, a monolithic chip. And so dealing with this... Um, um, sort of integrated approach, um, we didn't have to wrestle with the tougher part of packaging. Um, I think packaging has come a long way and uh, we've also given the thought experiment to um, basically uh, deconvoluting our current chip and 
basically producing an EIC and a PIC. So we're really, um, and I don't believe we'll lose any of the goodness, uh, still yet to be proven, but uh, our latencies, our, our power density, uh, less than five picojoules per bit, I don't think are going to suffer any with our current architectural flow. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. This was, you know, um, so this question, I'll, I'll jump to this one and then go back to some of the others. But, you know, what, what do you see the shortcomings or, you know, what, what, what's unknown or, un, you know, or what, what challenges ahead do you think you see in, in really deploying sulfur? silicon photonics as, as the communication channel because they're asking about power cost and latency obviously you know the, the those are totally different than running in the electrical domain and uh, you know obviously with a hyperscale data center for example the only way you get across it is is with, with enough bandwidth is with silicon well, with photonics but yeah you know, you talk socket to socket. I mean, are we really thinking this is practical for let's say a six inch reach or a yes. 12 inch across the board? Could you address some of those? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, obviously we're solving a lot of our issues today in a very localized domain, um, uh, socket, board, uh, rack, um, but we've proven that we have no loss of integrity of the signal um, because we're transmitting in, in the optical domain, the X band uh, or O band. And in many cases, um, we have probably four or five years ago and continuing a lot of different DARPA projects, also some key customers as well. Um, with our more recent um, Series C funding, we've added a lot more. Um, partners in the industry. And uh, all we're looking for now is to prove in an actual uh, compute domain, um, a storage domain, uh, the success of bringing an optically connected memory, optically connected um, processor, um, the success that we'd expect. So uh, this could actually the discussion could go on longer, but I think what you'll see in the ensuing year is probably some products where we have planted in an optical solution and we've actually improved the system performance, um, whether it be short reach, ultra short reach, all the way into uh, data center scales. Um, we're good up to at least two kilometers, if not more, um, but I think with these sort of parameters, uh, we feel uh, quite confident that we'll provide a, um, a solution to the need. Right. So, so you you have a you have a let's say an interconnect technology that can scale, as you said, from very short to very long. But you know, at smaller distances i mean you're obviously trading you know there's a power cost and latency that you're you you have that traditionally electrical hasn't had but or you know you know obviously as you're saying as you do the calculations it may still make sense i yes. mean okay. yeah there's a famous um uh, uh, gordon keeler from darpa's um, uh, presentation, I guess, probably about, I wish I would have put it in here, but it's sort of the uh, solution that we're providing in both a, a monolithic EIC, uh, PIC type chiplet is to basically bring our bandwidth density up where nothing can touch it right now. And also the interconnect link um, we're providing uh, almost a quantum leap in that as well. So, um, yeah, th I think we cover most ends from the ultra short reach all the way up to the data centers. Yeah. Good. Um, 
I, I think this this one should be obvious on the, in the world of chiplets, but I'll ask it. I mean, what there what what are the benefit drivers of integrating silicon photonics in the same package with a CPU ASIC FPGA die versus having them in separate packages? I mean, you know, it's well, I'll, I'll let you answer. I think I know the answer, but you know. well, some of the benefits are that we pretty much aligned ourselves with all standards, PCIe. Um, we're now into the UCIe um, in that we're providing some harmony for what will be leading edge components, um, whether it be CPUs, uh, we call them XPUs so that we can cover just about everything for our processor. And um, our die size is still um, less than 10 millimeters on the side. So yes, we do take up some real estate, but what we look like to the, to the um, shared interposer substrate is like just another flip chip. So we haven't disturbed it that much. And so integration is um, really from um, a chiplet down an easy situation. Yes, we have the fibers coming in, Yes, there are efforts to bring fiber attach in a more um, broad-based uh, availability and to qualify more and more suppliers to do that. Um, it's really just a micro-precision um, uh, placement of fibers. So in many ways, um, when you talk about latencies on the order of less than a nanosecond plus the time of flight, which has to be added into there, this is hands down something that's in the right regime, uh, particularly for um, um, uh, total energy per bit. The power that we operate is ridiculously low. And so the, with the energy per bit being less than five picoseconds or picojoules per, um, I'll forget that, uh, picojoules. Um, I think we've got the solution that ends up um, dominating uh, these types of integrated uh, um, packages where we're co-packaged with something else. Makes sense. And I'm, I'm assuming one of the reasons that you have your, your laser light source separate is for heat reasons, but uh, how, how sensitive are the, um, the photonic circuitry on the chiplets themselves to heat? I mean... Is, is that managing that is, well, is that a we, large issue or? We, we for its thermal environment, such as our micro ring resonators by providing a heater and uh, many circuit designers, even in this audience are using the principle, I need to control the temperature, local temperature um, quite well in order to uh, avoid inefficiencies of photonics um, inefficiencies that would occur on a monolithic chiplet. So um, in many ways you control the thermal environment, now it's not um, an issue. Uh, obviously photonics devices, if unheated, um, heated or cooled, um, are put onto a circuit, they are very subject to reliability and performance issues. In our case, we've sort of said, uh, we know that now, we need um, to control our environment quite well and quite precise. So we have a lot of IP around that area as well to avoid the, the sins of the past. Okay, got it. And yeah. that, that relates to uh, one of the other uh, a question, you know, especially with your background in reliability. I mean, you're, you're doing your homework, but are there still open concerns about the long-term reliability and wear out of the chiplets after you ship them? Again, these are fairly common types of materials used in even standard uh, electronic circuits. So um, our feel is that the product reliability will be very similar to what's in leading edge CPUs, GPUs, in that um, I the only question that we have is given the uh, randomness or um, indeterministic location of the external heat source 
Um, we have some reservations on laser reliability. But with that said, uh, we will have a fully functional application guide as to where to place that, what are the specifications for cooling, um, what is the um, uh, temperature range that you should be finding this in, and therefore we keep the power source uh, quite regulated. Obviously, we bring about the topic of field replaceable. We know full well that there will be some fallout um, of the lasers, but we feel that it is the best solution for a combination of the Terrify and the Supernova. Um, uh, there's still a lot more testing to be done, but in our current manifestation of the Terrify chiplet, uh, it works very well from a reliability aspect and a long-term reliability aspect as well. Good, good. Um, the next set of questions, I'll, I'll combine a few here. Um, what, what, you know, if you, if you look at your, look at your system, your components, um, looking at, you know, at the chiplet aspect of things, what, you know, obviously you're managing the yield or you you have yield yeah. exp expectations in your model. I mean, yeah. can, if you're comfortable, can you share, you know, where your biggest concerns are, i.e. where you think the lowest yield is going to be and what we need to do as an industry or group or can, can things be done to get them off the list of things that you're worried about or how they compare to, let's say, digital logic? I yeah. mean, you, 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 you've got some what a lot of people would probably consider yield nightmares <laughs> ahead of you. <laughs> I'll mention just one, and that's the assembly of the fiber, the fiber attach process. Yeah, we um, people have done um, fiber optics for a long time. Um, um, Bell Labs uh, under um, Dr. Heck um, wrote some uh, uh, seminal papers on fibers, but until we actually have quite a few suppliers capable of this, um, it's going to be a challenge, and that's where some of the uh, fallout will be um, um, in particular. So from a, um, and there's a growing number of uh, qualified vendors or suppliers to do fiber optic assembly, um, bringing in the fibers, attaching them, and um, doing strain relief. This is sort of the uh, non-monolithic uh, additive that still um, we could use some help, others could use help because we want to uh, enable this and not make it the showstopper. Um, I can probably name about five companies qualified to do fiber attach in the world and we need to increase that number to tens of uh, suppliers. And that's the beauty. Um, yeah, we also dealing with fabs, we have no good dye issues. Um, it's a electrical optical chip. Um, it's important to um, specify parameters quite uh, well. And uh, we have seen some progression in no good dye as well, going from a um, uh, multi-project wafer on into a production wafer. We've learned a lot in uh, making that transformation on yield and what's being decided, how we can test it, and also just helping the foundry work on the PDK and make improvements. And they also do it as well, knowing our test data. So to have, I would say one of the strongest things is to have an optical test operation within the foundry to help with this early look at the product performance. Um, if it's done by a second party, third party, uh, it's a little bit tougher to get that to work well. Uh, right. So, so you, right. F fiber is the big one, but you, you talked about the challenges of fabricating the, the chiplet and working mm -hmm. with the foundry. Is there elements of what's on the chiplet that you think are going to be the, the cause the highest yield issues? I mean, you, know, you talked about heaters. I mean, so things that are not traditional digital circuits, I mean, is there, you know, some leading no. candidates that you're really concerned about? 
No, the team has worked through all the sub circuits, circuits, modules within our chiplet and have uh, basically done the forensics to even early in the design phase, figure out how do we make this as bulletproof as possible under various conditions, various use conditions, power up, power down, um, cycling, and uh, they have brought it to the point that I can't even mention anything uh, that on um, the list of key care abouts or uh, worries um, would be involved in this. So um, uh, kudos to our team, um, quite strong team. Great. Uh, this is so fascinating. I, we could probably go on for longer, but I, yeah. I thank you so much, Steve, for well, the incredible you, presentation. And thank you. Appreciate it. And once again, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors, Adventist and ASC. Uh, Adventist uh, has received the highest ratings and customer satisfaction, the VLSI research survey for the last uh, two consecutive years. So congratulations to them. And uh, ASC, uh, supporting the chiplet era, which has begun in terms of providing advanced packaging and working with their customers like Li Hong has discussed to do heterogeneous integration and advanced packaging. So thank you both to Adventist and ASC who've made this webinar possible. I also would like to thank all the presenters and most importantly, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you.